I think what we're starting to see now is a is generations of anger being built up. I personally don't think a Martin Luther King would be as effective today as in the 50s and 60s. We've tried the turn the other cheek, the pray for your neighbor, the all that sort of stuff, and this is still happening. I hear you, but I also understand that nonviolent protests around the world have been very effective, like in, you know, Gandhi and um, other ones and, you know, Martin Luther King, I think, well, maybe I'm ignorant, but I thought that his, I thought he was taking the right approach then. Um, and maybe you're right, maybe that approach wouldn't work now. And that makes me incredibly sad. So I have to have a little background. So back in the eight, uh, 1987, I just graduated college living in Atlanta. And um, there was there's a county just north of Atlanta called Forsyth County. And it was known for being a, a Klan enclave. And maybe you guys might've learned about this in your history classes, but uh, no black people lived in Forsyth County because they'd been all driven out in earlier parts of the 20th century. So there was a, there was a brotherhood march that was happening and um, just soon before Martin Luther King day. And um, well, I'm not even sure, was that a holiday back then? I don't think it was an official holiday then. But anyway, um, there was a, a civil rights march through the streets of Forsyth County. And it, was in, it wasn't a big one, a big march, um, but you know the, the leaders were there, Hosea Williams and Joseph Lowry and people like that were there, the civil rights leaders. But they got um, hurled with rocks and bottles hurled at them and they were shouted down and injured and it just turned into chaos and so they had to get in their buses and go home they were basically chased out um and so they decided about a couple weeks later they someone put out the word that they were going to do another try again but put out the word far and wide and boy people came tens of thousands of people came and i got the word and my best friend and i jumped in a bus a school bus in downtown atlanta with a bunch of other people to go up to forsyth county and participate in this walk. And this time everybody was there. I mean, it was Andrew Young, Coretta Scott King, Joe, you know, um, Jesse Jackson, All everybody was there. And like something like 30,000 people showed up in buses, you know, in buses. Uh, turns out my own brother was there and I didn't even know it till like 20 years later. Um, so we, we, we were instructed on the bus very carefully. There was a leader on every bus to tell us what to do. And they said, this is what we're going to do. We're going to be silent. You're not going to say anything. You're not going to sing. You're not going to chant. You're not going to do anything. You're going to line up in rows, stay together, lock arms, um, and just walk. Don't engage with the people on the sides. You know, there were uh, National Guard lining the route the whole way. There were people on the other side of the National Guard with their signs saying all manner of horrible things. And they were yelling at us and children even. I mean, it was just horrifying. Um, but nobody, it didn't turn violent. So we were just silent. We were just silent, locked arms and walked because that's what we were told to do. And I have to tell you, I, I get chills just every time I think about it. I mean, I okay, here I am a white woman talking about something like this when so many other people have been through so many other things, but it was one of the most powerful things I've ever experienced. I just felt such power and love and unity and of purpose. It was beautiful. It was a wonderful thing. Um, then I think, then, okay, just fast forward to like 2020 and the George Floyd, George Floyd type style protests. And I watch on TV and I see the way it's done, like with that, with, you know, the yelling and the chanting and carrying signs. And I understand the anger. I understand how horrible, you know, just these feelings had to come out and be expressed and the anger and the rage. I mean, not just anger, but rage and and um, frustration and gosh, whatever, whatever else is wrapped up in that. Um, but, and then it, you know, it, it turned violent very close to where we live. And it was scary. It was a scary night. I mean, I remember us being, um, my husband and I being super scared. We were living in a temporary place while our house was getting remodeled. And it was very close to where some of the very violent stuff was going on um, here in Southern California. And I, I was scared. Um, so I wonder what, how, how, in my mind, I'm confused about the, the thing that I experienced Mm -hmm. in a completely different 
way, maybe a different time and maybe that's a relic of the past. I don't know, but I had a lot of trouble. I have a lot of trouble in my mind reconciling those yeah. two styles of protest and understanding what's behind it and how it has evolved. And then also there was then, you know, during the days after George Floyd, there were parades of cars going up and down our street in, in Long Beach, holding up signs, honking their horns, defund the police. And, you know, I went out there and I clapped and cheered and waved, but then I'm also thinking defund the police. What, what does that mean? I, yeah. you know, can I, should I be cheering? You know, what, am I implicitly oh, so saying I want the police to go away? You know, I don't even yeah. know. I was so confused by that. Um, that no. That's a good anyway. Yeah. There's a I know there's I'm cramming a lot there's in a there. Lot, but... yeah, there's a lot in, in kind of what you're saying. Um or what question that you have. Um I would say it's very hard to compare like a like protest over time because I think what we're starting to see now is a is generations of anger being built up. You know, I mean, it, it kind of makes me think of God knows what he's doing when he sends certain people at certain times, because I personally don't think a Martin Luther King would be as effective today as in the 50s and 60s, where now you're talking about, you know, generations of people and there's kind of this, okay, we've tried the turn the other cheek, the pray for your neighbor, the all that sort of stuff, and this is still happening. Um, and it kind of makes me think of, I don't know if you've seen the movie, The Great Debaters, one of the few movies where I saw my father cry. Um, it's pretty much, a, it's a, a, the story of the first kind of national championship all black debate team um, out of a Texas college um, called Wiley College. And in one of the final moments, and yes, well, it has its Hollywood effects to it. One of the final um, debate speeches that they make when they are debating against Harvard. And I think in real life, they were debating against USC, the national championship team. And, you know, they've been told to kind of play it safe, stay away from, um, you know, some of the really divisive topics. I mean, this was during Jim Crow. So stay away from a lot of that. But in the final speech, the young man doesn't. And he kind of gets the whole, like, they're lynching Black people in Texas right now. And one of the things he starts talking about is, you know, like be really grateful that we are responding to violence with nonviolence because you're pushing buttons and you're pushing it and, you're, and stop and think about your family. And if people are violently attacking your family, but you're not just to respond by defending, by picking up with the gun, you're supposed to turn the other cheek and be silent. He kind of pretty much makes this whole, be grateful. <laughs> that we are not responding, you know, in kind. And I think just nowadays, we have just this generation that's like, no, like it's time to respond in kind. I'm not saying that that is right or wrong, but I think that that is a lot of the built up anger and attitude. And a lot of, you know, unfortunately in this era of kind of media sensationalism, it's about what's going to get attention. Um, you know, with riots and protests, and one of the things that is so interesting is even when I, I, I try to pay attention to kind of all sides of the news. And one of the things that is interesting is um, in when there is kind of quiet protest or peaceful protest or whatever, you know, what you see is the reaction of like, I'm trying to get to work, like get on the sidewalk. And, we, so, and I was just like, you know, Martin Luther King didn't march on the sidewalk and wait for the lights to turn green. He marched up the street. Like protest is designed to disrupt and get your attention right and so now it's just unfortunately people are taking bigger things like what's going to get your attention because us like you know holding hands and waiting till the light turns green and like only crossing when you're not being disrupted when you're trying to get to work or you know trying to disrupt you when you're like watching a football game like that's not going to get it we have to wake you up like somehow and unfortunately nowadays it takes drastic means to the second part of it with the defund the police thing, I hate the term. I know what they mean living here in Chicago. Just to kind of give you a realism here, I lived on the north side and now live on the south side of Chicago in Hyde Park. Um, the difference in funding of schools versus police is huge. On the north side, you see through taxpayer dollars, White kids get laptops, swim teams, water polo teams, debate teams, and coaches, and everything of that sort. On the South Side, right, 
the amount of money spent per child is like a third of that what is spent in the suburbs. And you know where the rest of that money goes? The police. So these kids down here, they don't have laptops. There are some schools that don't have Wi-Fi. <laughs> you know, down here. Yes, it's it's really, really terrible. Right. Like there are actually been Chicago Bears players who've gone around like giving money for, for reasons like that, right? There's no like after school centers and after school programs. There are like former school pools that are drained and they're just filled with junk, like that sort of a thing. But they have cops patrolling the campus. They have, you know, metal detectors everywhere. And so there's this whole nonsense. The, the, the notion is if you were to take some of the money that you're spending on policing these kids and spend the same amount of money that you do on the white kids in Evanston and up north, I guarantee you, you're going to see a different result out of these kids, right? And, you know, it's also the same thing in terms of accountability. Here in the city of Chicago, over the last 10 years, that over $500 million in taxpayer money has gone towards settlements for police misconduct but the cops get to keep their pensions. And where were the pensions come from? From us. So there is the behavior of like, hey, how about the next time the police are caught acting out, take it from their pensions. Don't take it from us. <laughs> you know. And I bet they'll start holding one another accountable a lot more. That is more the notion of it. Just defund it. I just don't think that's the right word for it, but it's really like, take this money from here and put it here. And so that these kids know they matter as much as the white kids on the north side and that they deserve as much opportunity and they deserve after school programs and all of that sort of a thing. Hey, when cops act out, don't say, hey, taxpayers, there's another $44 million that y'all have to pay. So you know what? Y'all acted out. It's coming from your pension. And I guarantee you'll see a different culture there. I know, Marcus, I'm getting kind of a little bit in your territory, but that is a lot of, <laughs> that is a lot of the, the, the mindset around it but again i just don't think it's a well scripted message i think it was a yeah exactly i i thought it meant exactly as you described but you just it made it so much more illuminating for me i know marcus wants to respond but before uh, he does susan um the the confusion between behind the protests can you sh can you share a little bit what's the motivation for you asking that question like what what makes that an important question for you just witnessing so much, so much protest, especially in the past few years, just evolve into chaos and violence and burning and destroying, and wondering why why does it come to that? Like how can, how can protest be done in such a way that communities aren't destroyed? And it's usually the communities of people who are you know can least afford it. Um, and just having had. The experience I did and watching the stuff on, you know, play out on TV and sometimes right outside the door. What, you know, what happened, but I think Marin helped answer that and I had I had an inclination that it was just about about that, but I, I remember Colin sure. Kaepernick tried. And what? Look at, remember Colin Kaepernick tried. He was oh, I know, he wasn't I know. doing anything. And no, I know. That, you're right. I know. And that like didn't, again, but I think that's I, kind of the whole. Can I say though, thing. can I say you know, though in the in defense of the march that happened um, in, in, that I witnessed, it was covered nationwide and it, it, it triggered so much in Georgia, just so much. And it, Oprah, Oprah came to cover it and did a whole show about I it. That. I mean, yeah, it was, it was a big deal. And, and I don't know. I, I just see in the, I hear you, but I also understand that nonviolent protests around the world have been very effective. Like in, you know, Gandhi and um, other ones and, you know, Martin Luther King, I think, well, maybe I'm ignorant, but I thought that his, I thought he was taking the right approach then. Um, and maybe you're right, maybe that approach wouldn't work now. And that makes me incredibly sad, but, um, and Colin Kaepernick, you're right. He, it, I, I, I hated what happened to Colin Kaepernick. I mean, it's awful. It's like, shut up and play, you know, would you, <laughs> what? Yeah. And with he, has that right, said, he has a right to kneel. Mm -hmm. He does. You know? And with that said, Marcus, what are your thoughts on protest and community and, I mean, exercising, you know, that right vis-a-vis -vis the vitriol that's coming toward law enforcement? Uh, 
I mean, I get it. I understand the anger and the frustration that people have, particularly Black people. I understand what emotion that invokes when there is police misconduct. Um, I, I mean, I have the same exact emotion. I think for me being in law enforcement and seeing both sides of it, Marin articulated or she said, she doesn't agree with the message of defunding the police. She thinks that it's a bad slogan, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, when there is police misconduct, take it out of their pension or redirect the funds to schooling or to other programs. Um, for me, I guess the disconnect is and that's all fine and good if you feel that way. But at the same time, we're not focused on why the funding has to be so high in certain mm -hmm. areas. Mm -hmm. Why do we have to give these funds to the police? Why is there a need to have more police in one area versus another? Or why is there a need to direct more funds to the police on the South side than on the North. So, and at the same time, when there is police misconduct and you take it out of their pension, what is that gonna solve? What are you telling or doing to the cops who actually give a damn or mm -hmm. that go to work every day and do the right thing? Who are not acting out. Mm -hmm. I think, when you look at the number of police that we have in the country versus the number of police that do something wrong or there is misconduct or whatever the case may be, like that number statistically is significantly not what it's purported to be. <laughs> and so, I mean, I don't have the answer. Um, do I think that funding and underprivileged municipalities for schools, do I think that's an issue that needs to be addressed? Yes. But at the same time, I, I think it's just twofold and too often we are reactionary versus looking at reality. And why is it this way? And why is there a need for it to be this way? And so. What would you have us consider from your perspective of analysis, given what you just said? What, like, as we as lay people who don't work in law enforcement, what, and so we're just, I mean, most of us are just going off of what we see in pop culture about law enforcement. What would you have us consider when, before we make statements like defund the police or just move money or, all the things, like you said, we should consider why we have so many police in one area and little police and much many fewer police in another area. I think it's literally just being conscious and aware of reality. Um, What's, what's the reality? What's the reality as it relates to the, the need for investment in law enforcement? Because unfortunately, there are bad people out there. Crime happens everywhere, no matter where you live. Wherever you live, your perception of crime and what you think occurs next door to you is much lower then you realize and you know. You may think that your neighborhood is completely safe. It is not. Things happen every day that the general public have no idea that happens because it doesn't make the news. 
Um, it's not a headline topic. You may never even hear about it. There could have been cops at a house, two houses down from yours last night for any given reason. And if you don't know those neighbors or you didn't have a neighbor that saw it or told you, like you'd have no idea. You have no idea what happens. So there's a lot more protection happening that we don't even know about. Yeah, absolutely. So we're being cavalier when we make statements like that, like absolutely. defund the police. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. so those funds may be and, needed. And I know a lot of the premise around mental health is that's that surrounds the whole defund the police topic. But at the same time, and a hot topic is de-escalation and the training. So on one hand, you're saying the training, the training, train the police, train them. They need to be trained on this. They need to be trained on that. De-escalation, how to deal with mental health, yada, yada, yada. But then you're saying defund them. Defund the police. So if you essentially defund the police, isn't that taking away the training that you say that we need to have? Essentially, I know we talk a lot about racism, discrimination, unjust things. And so I guess this would be more so directed toward Mary. And so you, you had this raw emotion when you brought up the subject and when you were talking about it and that people are frustrated, people are fed up. And so the protests are happening this way because it is generations of built up aggression or anger, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. So in feeling that, and you know that feeling, and, and we know what it's like to be discriminated against or to be looked down upon or generalized simply because of the color of your skin, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So say Susan is walking down the street and she gets jumped by three black women and they they beat her steal her purse whatever the case may be and so two weeks from now susan is walking down the street and she sees you and she has reservations mm -hmm. and she kind of maybe she clutches her purse or right. she has a fear you're going to feel some type of way because you're going to be like oh that's karen Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like, you're just doing that to me because I'm black. So essentially, it's it's kind of like the same thing. Yes, I understand that there are police that have done things that are wrong. I understand mm -hmm. that there are some black and brown men who have been unjustly killed by the police. Like, not every cop is a good cop. Right. But at the same time. We as black people, I feel, have a tendency to project hate or to generalize mm -hmm. certain populations or the police. Mm -hmm. And in turn, we do the very thing that we don't like done to us. Mm -hmm. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Yeah, I, I, I think like as you were talking and, and this is something i've actually been thinking about all weekend long with with obviously with what's happening in current events is something has shifted um where because i i can say even as a young black girl there was there was a respect and a community relationship that we had with police that it's only been within recent probably three four years mm -hmm. that i mean i see cops around out and about in in chicago all the time um i didn't used to feel that same kind of hesitation and, and i felt like a lot of it it was it was kind of twofold number one i knew more cops like growing up of all of, of races, black and white. There are black police officers that went to my church, white police officers that I knew in my neighborhood. Um, you know, there was that piece. And then I did also feel there was the intersectionality piece of me being a woman. You know, I have seen, I have seen cops of all races react very differently to me than my three brothers. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, 
but I can say it's just been a uh, different, recent, different, like, Marion, different how. Years. I'm sorry? Different how. Um, a little bit more trepidation, a little bit more quickly. Like, like if I, like I've approached a police officer before, um, honestly, like just to ask a question or ask for assistance, not in like in an emergency sort of situation. I've seen my younger brother do the same thing and the cop put his hand on his waistband that he did not do when it was me approaching. Um, those sorts of things. Um, so a lot more trepidation, a lot more ready to react. Um, and, you know, my brother's not a small man. Um, you know, he, he is a former athlete. Um, but yeah, things, things like that that I've seen um, to the point that even when my brothers have come to visit me here in Chicago, the cops that I see, you know, around and about at the donut shop and stuff like that, I make the point of introducing them and letting them know I have three brothers that are coming into town so that I don't, so hopefully to kind of nip some of that in the bud, right? Um, but I can say there is now like a trepidation and a mistrust and um, that I didn't used to have. Um, and it, I guess it's just a, a feeling as if something in the culture has changed like I don't know if it's like the policing culture or our general culture and the attitude about policing that where I used to think nothing of oh there's a cop you know up the street Andre I'm thinking of when you and I are, were partying that time I was Houston, gonna say you that gonna share that story passed out I so, cannot say I would have reacted the same way today so to give everyone context the St. Patrick's weekend I was visiting Andre in Houston we were walking around you know people do what they do St. Patrick's Day right and he and I were walking and there was a young white woman. She was probably like college age-ish. And she was clearly passed out in front of a building. Like almost like she went to buzz in and didn't quite make it. And like her purse was open and she was just, right? And I was like, we have to get her help. Like, <laughs> and there was a, there were two cops sitting in a car up the street. And I was like, Andre, there's police right there. And I literally went up to the police and I said, there was a young woman passed out here, you know, and immediately like went for help. I cannot say to this day, I would have done the same thing. And let me add a little bit more to, to give you some of that story. Initially, Marin asked me, Andre, go wake her up. And I told her no way in hell because this inebriated white woman is gonna see this black man and she's gonna think assailant. And then with the cops so close by, I'm gonna be in handcuffs. This is me projecting my future, whether that was even gonna happen or not. So I said, you go get the cops and I will stand here and watch her. And I stood a good eight feet away from that woman. So I could not be mistaken of as a rapist or anything that was gonna harm that white girl. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. And I did, and I went up and I got the police and, you know, and they, you know, took control of the situation and woke her up and got her help and, and all of that. But I can't say if that were to happen St. Patrick's Day 2023, I would be like, I don't know if the cops would be our first, our first reaction. There's just something now there that that would bring about, because I would be like, oh my gosh, we're going to be inviting drama and trouble. And what are you two Black folks doing walking around Midtown Houston? And like, oh, you know, all of I'm like, want to do that <laughs> that that now enters my mind but what negative interaction with law enforcement have you yourself had that would even give you that reservation other than watching something on the news i have i mean i i have why would we not have it given what we've seen on the news i haven't i don't know i don't get that part so let me ask you, let me ask a question, unless um, I don't know, Landon or Susan, if you have uh, any questions, please feel free to chime in. No, go ahead. Mar Marcus, you, you told a story at the beginning, um, a, you know, a pretend story that about, let's say, a woman who was accosted by three Black women, I think you said, um, and that you would understand a feeling of anxiety and weariness in the future that we would all in some way if if that woman came across another black woman let's say mm -hmm. imagine that there that that scenario was covered on the news mm -hmm. and another white woman in that area or in another area for that matter saw that same thing happen right they didn't have that experience but they had 
they saw a story and then maybe it's just, we don't see that story all the time but maybe we saw that story play out um three or four times in the news um i think we would probably understand i don't i do, i would understand and i'd like your kind of reaction marcus you know that the white person the white the, another white woman let's say watching the news might go like okay well this happened one time this happened two times this happened three times that i've seen maybe i just need to be more more careful in certain situations and maybe not, not they're not even thinking that consciously i mean maybe um, you know in some cases they might think of it consciously that some cases they they might not um I, I would just say you know i mean i don't i don't resonate with this marcus and i i don't have the feeling in my heart like this but i I, I come from the, you know, I'm I'm Jew, I'm, I'm Jewish. You know, I told Andre during the course of our conversations, I don't feel fear, even though, you know, when you tabulate hate, you know, hate acts, Jews come out on top, right? They're not, they're mostly not violent, so they're not of the same quality as you we we might see in the black community. But there's a whole lot of them. But I don't feel, I don't personally feel concerned. But I know some people who do. They 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 hear about, well, clearly the Pittsburgh scenario was, was violence right but they hear you know a swastika put on this you know synagogue or they hear about these other things and they they didn't have that experience but they they're concerned about it they walk out you know maybe with a little wariness and um i think it, it would seem to me it would seem to me that you in your story even though your story was painted as someone who has as someone who had a direct experience that you have some intuition about people feeling concerned about others based on stories, right? Based on things they've seen to be the case in some ways. And there's something you said about, you know, the the amount of cops who who engage in police misconduct is small, but sometimes it doesn't seem small right um i don't know how do you how do you take that in and i guess how do you what i would like to know in relationship to that is like when you see just to bring out the pink elephant you know <laughs> um um directly when you see the incident in in memphis and like how do you what does it spark in you thoughts what thoughts and feelings does it spark in you as you kind of also, I don't know, answer to the to the idea that maybe we can feel things even we don't experience. Um, I I watched the video from Memphis last. I worked last night, and when the video was released, I was at work, so I watched it at my desk, mm -hmm. and I literally teared up. Mm -hmm. Um, it hurt. Mm -hmm. It was completely wrong. Mm -hmm. Like I struggled to watch the, I think it was like home security footage of someone's home that they it was the street camera. Cam. It was the street cam it was above. Cam. And when I clicked that video and I started watching it, like that was hard to watch. Mm -hmm. There's no justification for it. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that I can say that would even remotely make that okay like it was wrong and whatever transpires or happens to them i truly feel that they deserve it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. now have there been other instances that someone has been killed and i felt that it was justifiable yes i think mm -hmm. the general notion that an unarmed person cannot be killed by the police is ignorant. Um, if yes. Todd, if you were a jujitsu fighter mm -hmm. and you encountered me on the street and you wanted to attack me and you're unarmed, but you are about to whoop my ass <laughs> and you could take my gun and kill me, then yes, mm -hmm. I'm justified. Like, I think people think that because you are a cop that you have this magic ability to de-escalate situations or 
subdue every person that you encounter and that's just not the case there are bad people out there there are bad people who are sometimes unarmed that can be shot and killed by the police there are and that's just the reality and to todd's point like there are bad people out there they're also bad cops so because i take this very personally and i, I have a leeriness because the fallout and who the fallout from me being let, let's say encountering and in, or engaged by a bad cop could potentially ruin my life and everything that i've worked for so just similar because i agree with you you know just because you're a cop doesn't mean you have a magic wand or you're some svengali that can subdue a person and just because you know i'm happen to be of a group where cops have maybe encountered their men because i am a man i self-identify as a man uh hyper aggressive and things doesn't necessarily mean that i'm not i'm going to get grace in that situation do you see that mm -hmm. i can understand that Mm -hmm. Right. So, I mean, I, I, I can say, like, w when when you were asking me, like, oh, like, what negative, you know, encounters have I had with police to make me feel that way? Like, a big reason why I paused is because while I, while it was not a directly negative sort of situation, I did feel some kind of way about a cop putting his hand on his waist when my brother is approaching him when he didn't do that with me uh and and that just yeah that you know i don't know that that's definitely something that has just kind of kind of sat with me but um you know i do stop and, and try to think about what could what could fix it right um i at least know and, and right now i know most about police from a standpoint of being here in chicago and like i know one thing that has been discussed is that cops are not required to live in the communities that they police at least not here in chicago and that used to be a thing a while ago um and that that has led to you know obviously when you're going into a neighborhood where you don't know that's Pookie's mom on the corner. Just ask her what's going on. She can break it down for you, right? But instead, like, you just come in kind of guns blazing, quote unquote, that there's just like tension on both ends. And so people said, is that part of the issue? Like, like I, I don't really know. Um, I, I also think it has not helped. And again, I'm coming from the perspective of Chicago that like, it has really come out with a lot of these lawsuits that, you know, scandals were much more entrenched into a, you know, covering up for one another. There's a code amongst cops that you don't snitch that like, it came out like 60, 70% of them, like apparently via survey admitted to, oh yeah, they see misconduct, but you don't snitch. That also made me be like, wait a minute, that's a lot of police officers. You know, so, so everything. So I think that's why I'm just like, is it like a cultural code thing? And and how do you, how do you fix it? And I say that also like now living on the south side and knowing like there's clearly a no snitch culture <laughs> that is prevalent down here as well. Um, you know, and it definitely doesn't help situations in in terms of some of the the crime issues that we're having. Like, what is next? How how do you get past this? so that people do see for the, you know, what we're seeing on the news is rare. Can I comment real quick? Yeah, yeah, please. Um, yeah, I appreciate everybody's, all the mentions of this. I, I'm, I'm a skeptic of narratives, you know? Um, I grew up in a narrative, that was the Mormon narrative. Mm -hmm. And when I got outside of it, I saw how we took the facts of the world and we made them into a story that made us the true um, people uh, that God, God's chosen people, you know, um, that was a very disturbing after the fact. Um, and, and it, I think all groups do this, you know, um, and I think we really have to be aware of the power of the internet and social media now to propagate narratives. Because if you look into any of these instances of uh, altercations with police, people dying, they're all very individual, you know, the same things didn't happen every time. Sometimes, you know, the cops clearly at fault and sometimes 
you know, the victim is more at fault. Sometimes the cop is just clearly underprepared. Sometimes the cop is just angry and violent, right? So um, fitting them all into a single narrative, I think, is is um, not good for, you know, understanding these interactions. And, and you know, the, the, the police are a bureaucracy. They, they do any group of humans with a mission that involves their, you know, their life and uh, how they make money, they're going to try to keep themselves as secure as they can, right, from the slings and arrows of the people that don't agree with them. So I wonder what the, I, I wonder the same thing as you, Marin, is how do we, number one, get outside the narrative? I really like to look at the statistics on all of these things as much as I can. Sometimes those are reliable, but, you know, I think, you know, how do we get people, um, should, should members of the community who are scared of the police, should they have a program where they, they ride with the police sometimes and they see this? Atlanta like, has that. Well, yeah. Does this work? I mean, there has to be uh, some way for us to address these issues instead of just strengthening the narratives and and further deepening hatred you know and rage um mm -hmm. and i wonder what those what those answers look like i want to extend a formal thank you to marcus for being a servant of the community and lay and getting out there and and putting his life and limb at risk so that we can feel safe as a whole um i just want to put that out there yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for your service. Thank you for watching this episode of Healing Race and stay with us for a scene from our next video. If you want to see more conversations like the one you just watched, please subscribe to our channel, share this video with friends and family and like and comment on the video below. If you'd like to be a guest on one of our episodes and have an open, real conversation about race, email us at guests at healingraceshow.com. And if there are topics you think we should cover, we'd love to hear them. So please email your ideas to topics at healingraceshow.com. As always, thanks for your support. We look forward to continuing the conversation with you. Now, here's a scene from our next Healing Race. So in my 10 years in law enforcement, my experience has been that I am more so, I, I'm treated worse by my own people, by black people than I am by white. And that's not to say that I haven't been mistreated by white people, mm -hmm. but it is a blatant difference mm -hmm. um, when I encounter a black person versus a white person and it's hurtful because in a sense, to me, and I get everything that is going on that you see on the news or different issues or incidents, but to me, it seems as if you would want to see someone who looks like you wearing the uniform and doing the job. And my experience has been more often that that's not the case. And I'm more so outcast from the community in a sense, um, mm -hmm. accused of being an Uncle Tom or a sellout. Um, and these are things people have said to you. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. absolutely. Almost yeah. a daily occurrence. So mm -hmm. it's, I don't know. I don't know how to process it. Uh, to watch the rest of that episode, go ahead and click the video below me. To see a different compelling Healing Race episode, you can click the video below me. We look forward to seeing you in the next video.